Will you please join me in the call to worship? In mystery and grandeur, we see the face of God. In earthiness and the ordinary, we know the love of Christ. In the heights and depths and life and death, the Spirit of God is moving among us. Let us praise God. I will light a light in the name of the Son, who saved the world and stretched out his hand to me. I will light a light in the name of the Spirit, who encompasses the world and blesses my soul with yearning. We will light three lights for the Trinity of love God above us, God beside us, God beneath us, the beginning, the end, and the everlasting one.
seated. Do you guys have room for one big fat backside in the middle of you? Can you make room? Can you make room for... I got some things to show you. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's see. Let's see if we can do this without falling down. All right. How are you? Everybody good? All right. I want to show you some things this morning. I don't know if you can see these, but I have some family pictures to show you. So that's me in the church where I was the pastor in Vermont, and that's my nep- one of my nephews and my niece, one of my nieces. Let me pass that around. And this is my mother who lives in New Hampshire. And that picture was taken on Cape Cod, way out in Massachusetts. And that's my father and my stepmother. See? Okay. Now, this is family. What are you nervous about that picture? I'm the only what in that picture? What am I the only one of in that picture? Can you see? Do you see any more than one guy in the picture? I'm surrounded by all kinds of people. This is my cousin and my mother and my wife and my aunt. Oh, yeah, and we call them aunts in New England, sorry. Um, and my sister and my niece and my cousin's two girls. And they were adopted from foreign countries. I'm going to hold this one. Yep. This is Jessie. She came from Cambodia. And this is Haley. She came from the foreign country known as Rhode Island. <laughs> so, and these people are just like family. They're my, so- they're my best friend's soccer coaches. So those are my, that's my family. Now, do you have family here today? Do you have family here today? Who's got family here today? There we go. That's what I want you to do. Down here and here. Can you show me? Point, point to me where your family is. Up there. Who can, who can show me where family is? Where's your family? Up there. Where? Put your hand up if you're being recognized. There we go. All right. Cool. Who else? Who else has got family here? Where? Point them out. Up there. That seems to be the family gallery, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Where else? Where? Point. Okay. All the way in the back. We need to see a hand. Okay. Good. Because I can't see that far. So. All right. Got him? Anybody else? All right. So, in our gospel story today, Jesus' mother and siblings, brothers and sisters, come And they come because they think he's in trouble. They actually think he's a little crazy. And they want to see him. But they can't get in. The crowd's so big. And so people tell Jesus, your family's waiting for you. And he says, you know what? Everybody who believes in what God teaches and who loves God is my what? Family. Family. Everybody is a family. So you know what? See this whole wonderful group of people out here? We're really lucky because when we follow Jesus, we have a huge family. This is what Jesus teaches us. So everyone out there who is family for these children, put your hands up. Yeah, see? This is your family. And if you ever need anything or you're ever in trouble, remember... Jesus tells us that this is our family and we share a lot of love together loving Jesus and God. So, all right, I, I think it's time to go. Yeah, all right, but we can't go without you helping me. You ready to say, help me say the peace of Christ be with you? Okay, peace of Christ be with you. Say on three, ready? And then we'll go out and greet everyone. Ready? One, two, three. The peace of Christ be with you. Let's go greet one another.
I think you can remain standing. Would you please join me in the unison prayer? Our God is with you. Let us unite in prayer. Holy Trinity, you are sacred three. Blessed one, elusive God, we pray to you, creator, that we may give forth new life. Christ, that we may be rooted deeply in this life. Spirit, that we may soar beyond possibilities. May your strange and comforting ways be our ways. Amen. about you, but it was hard to stay seated during that one. <laughs> one of the great things about summer is <clears throat> we get to showcase some of the musical talents in the congregation and the community that we don't necessarily get to see the rest of the year, so really neat. In our reading from Mark's Gospel, Jesus teaches an exceptionally large crowd and his family comes to see him. <clears throat> and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when Jesus' family heard it, they went out to seize him. For people were saying, he is beside himself. 
And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul and casts out the demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus called them and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against Satan and is divided, Satan cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But none can enter the house of the strong and plunder their goods without first binding the strong. Then indeed they may plunder the house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven human beings and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, Jesus has an unclean spirit. And Jesus' mother and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to Jesus, and they called him. And a crowd was sitting about Jesus, and they said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother? And my brothers. And looking around on those who sat about him, Jesus said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. May God bless our hearing and understanding of this holy word. Jesus' popularity is growing, he's performing miracles like cleansing lepers, restoring withered hands, and saying strange things like, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Your sins are forgiven. Hey, disciples, I give you the authority to cast out people's demons. He's drawing an uncomfortable amount of attention to himself, so much so that two groups, family members who love him and others who are threatened by him, begin asking the very same question. Is this guy crazy? In verse 21 of this morning's gospel lesson, we see his loved ones staging a failed intervention. They went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. And then Mark tells us just one verse later that the religious establishment asserts he is possessed by Beelzebul, or by the devil. In our culture, we use the word crazy in seven or eight different ways, depending on the context in which we're speaking. When we are using the term in its most serious or most derogatory fashion, we mean that one is who is crazy is mentally deranged, demented, or insane. If we refer to something as a crazy scheme, we mean it's senseless, impractical, or totally unsound. To be crazy about someone else is to be infatuated with them. To be crazy to try out those new skis means that one is eager or impatient. And if we say that she always wears crazy hats, we think her fashion sense is singular at best, unusual or bizarre at worst. And For those of you who remember the beatnik era, and I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, one might have said back then, that's crazy, man, crazy. And we'd be talking about something wonderful or excellent or perfect. Jesus' friends fear and his adversaries are convinced that he is crazy in the sense of being mentally deranged, demented, or insane. While we have the benefit of our faith tradition and historical perspective to understand that Jesus isn't crazy, he's in fact living in accord with the will and the heart and the purpose of God. But we must admit that the speculation surrounding him is not totally off the rails. What else must brothers and sisters who for 30 years have known a normal Jesus assume? What other conclusion could the scholarly religious authorities come to 
Sane and non-possessed people don't turn their lives into a spiritual freak show. They don't make claims to deity. They don't publicly discuss demons. That's not normal. Not then. Not now. But sometimes crazy and genius look a lot alike, don't they? It's not that Jesus is mad. No, it's just that his teachings, his actions, his unconditional love for others, his ethics, his approach to justice, stand in such contrast to the way we assume life should be that it surprises us and it shakes our foundations. Humanity had never seen such power on public display. It had never heard such values being taught. It had never witnessed such dynamic, charismatic, and divine authority wrapped in so much weakness. Jesus was a homeless, self-made rabbi from Nazareth with, to borrow the words of the prophet Isaiah, no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Admit it, we would have called him mad too. Jesus, for his part, does not seem overly bothered by the accusations that he is crazy, as in completely insane. In his life and death and resurrection, he reveals an important truth to those of us who would be his disciples. The kingdom of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, when on the move, will always, always disrupt and disturb a sane world. If craziness is persistently violating social norms with little regard for oneself, then the work of Jesus fits this description. The world idolizes logic and reason, yet God's people live by faith and we love mystery. The world usually abuses the weak and attempts to fix the poor. God's people embrace the lowly as the greatest among us. The world rewards the strongest and most capable. When we are at our best and most faithful, we openly confess our struggles and repent our sins. Our world says you are entitled to hate those who hurt you, yet we love our enemies and pray for our persecutors. We receive from the world every day the message to stock up as much earthly treasure as we can before we die. Guided by Jesus' concern for the least of these, we seek to give it away and lay up treasure in heaven. The world says, let the poor and hungry pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and let the refugee go somewhere else so as not to use up the resources of our country. But we who follow Jesus hear his voice ringing in our ear. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Love yourself and try not to hurt your neighbor is the mantra we hear communicated from many in our time. When we're inspired to listen to the risen Christ, our motto becomes, love your neighbor, and in doing so, let's be willing to sacrifice ourselves. The way of the world seems to be sleeping in on Sunday and brunching before noon. We sometimes have to summon our resolve to get out of bed and come and sing praise to our God whom we cannot see, but whom we believe loves us and holds us close now and forever. And when we finally get out of church, we have to wait in line for the table at our favorite lunch spot. So if Christians are called crazy from time to time, well, as Jesus might have put it during his earthly ministry, welcome to my world. Here's the deal. The God in whom we believe is above and beyond any and all cultures, perspectives, or political views. No one tribe or nation or culture completely gets God. Therefore, in some way, 
as God breaks into our world through Jesus, through our scripture, and through the Holy Spirit that fills us people. God will in some way offend and jar the sensibilities of everyone at one time or another. So if the God we worship is not deeply disrupting and uncomfortably confronting some part of our lives, then the God we worship is likely one of our own creation, not the creator of the universe. Nowhere is this illustrated more vividly than in the gospel itself. The incarnation, that is, Jesus in human form revealing God to us, doesn't make sense. Do you want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. The paradox of fully human, fully divine, messes with our brains. The cross, God in flesh giving his life as a gift for evil and rebellious humanity, that's just crazy talk. It's pure foolishness. But, as Paul puts it in his first letter to the Corinthians, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And our teachings about salvation, about what our relationship with God is based upon, every other religious tradition requires that the one being rescued do something, grow in certain knowledge or demonstrate certain obedience. But we are told that Christ died for us while we were still sinners and made us alive when we were dead. We bring nothing to the table. Instead, God, by God's own spirit of life, brings us and feeds us an unending course of undeserved mercy and grace. It runs counter to all we celebrate in our world. It's not how careers are forged, how championships are won, or how a heart is wooed. To the human ear, this is completely ludicrous. And yet, it's true. Ha! And the resurrection? Enough said. And when this ludicrous truth lays hold of us, it changes us. Or at least it can, if we haven't been sold some lie about a safe and sound Christianity or a Christianity that compromises its moral principles for political gain. Look at the first century church. We need only turn to the book of Acts, where dumbfounded, wide-eyed, with wonder, the world responds to the early Christians, the early believers, the early followers of Jesus. Look at them. They share their stuff. They celebrate in their struggles. They eat flesh and they drink blood. We can't hate them. They're crazy as hoot owls. Look at church history. There we find countless examples of people who confronted the culture and paid the ultimate price. St. Francis of Assisi, Sir Thomas More, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Mother Teresa. For today, just Google those folks if you want to see crazy. But I'll share their stories at some point down the road. Can we Christians still be crazy after all these years? Can the power of the Holy Spirit make us that way in our day and age? The answer is unequivocally yes. God is still speaking and the Holy Spirit is still making us crazy to be faithful disciples of Jesus. Since 2006, Joan Cheever has been feeding the homeless in San Antonio. That's San Antonio, Texas, by the way. She's been feeding them out of a food truck for which she has a permit. But a couple of years ago, The city council outlawed feeding the homeless in the streets, and the police gave her a citation. When Cheever protested that the police were infringing upon her right to practice her religion, they told her that she should go to a church and pray. This is how I pray, she told them. I pray when I cook. I pray when I serve. The National Coalition for the Homeless 
reported recently that 71 cities have passed or attempted to pass laws restricting food sharing. Joan Cheever, disciple of Christ, has no intention of stopping her ministry, no matter the consequences for her personal well-being. And she's already paid several thousand dollars in fines to keep being a proactive disciple of Jesus Christ. Boston Police Commissioner William Evans credits the Catholic Church and his own deep faith for shaping his life and the way he teaches others to do their policing. Known for his motto, kill him with kindness, Commissioner Evans was one of the first persons on the scene after the bombing five years ago at the Boston Marathon. He saw every bit of the horror. And yet, Commissioner Evans, faithful to the teachings of Jesus and learning from the examples of Pope Francis and Boston Cardinal Sean O'Malley, says he doesn't think that Jokar Sarnayev should be put to death for the bombing. He admits that his law enforcement side pulls him the other way, and he's been chastised for many others who, in good faith, disagree with him for his beliefs. But he says his Christian faith calls him to oppose the death penalty. And Pope Francis, is there a crazier Christian in the Jesus kind of good way on the planet? He told the College of Cardinals, you have elected me to become Pope. God forgive you. And just look at that goofy grin as he eats with the poor, washes the feet of prisoners, supports the science behind the theory of evolution advocates for a living wage for all workers and lives humbly as a disciple of Christ, including when he is wrong, asking for forgiveness, as he did in a very public way last week. Just plain crazy for Jesus. Or how about crazy Dr. Dave Fry, the recently retired Presbyterian pastor in Georgia, who in his retirement goes every week to see a patient with dementia who has no idea who he is, but with whom he connects by singing old gospel songs that the patient sings along with him. Dave said that when he visited this past week, he was going to show just how crazy he is, belting out the Lord's Prayer like he's one of the three tenors, even if everyone else in the place is terrified by his off-key rendition. What if the church today embraced her craziness? What if the church chose to bear hug her weirdness? We all have that one neighbor on the block who just doesn't care what the other neighbors think. Everybody has that one neighbor who lets his freak flag fly. He puts out the gaudiest decorations for Christmas. He checks his mail in his boxer shorts. He sits in the driveway with a smile on his face, drinking wine from a box and waving hello to all who pass by. What if the church was that guy? What would the church look like? Would the church be less put off when the homeless woman wanders in on a Sunday morning, giving her a seat of honor and affording her great dignity? Would the church encourage radical generosity among the people? You know, the kind of generosity that makes people talk about you behind your back? Would the church preach the frightening depths of God's expectations for justice for all people, along with the jaw-dropping and offensive amount of grace that's afforded to us in Christ? Jesus' friends and families, along with his enemies, were wondering if he was crazy. The question for us as the church in our time is this. Are we crazy enough? The answer will undoubtedly be no, but we keep trying. Let us be set free with the insane message of the gospel. Christ has been crucified to cover our lack of crazy. Let us go forth out the door with the reminder that we have been set free as agents of an upside-down and wacky world known as the kingdom of God. Yes, 
no question, some will take offense at the whole notion of being crazy for Jesus. So let us take comfort in a few thoughts. First, just because we're labeled as weird doesn't mean we actually are. Some of the world's greatest influencers were once thought nuts, like Beethoven and Sir Isaac Newton. We're in good company. Second, if we do come under fire for radically and faithfully following Jesus and are ultimately called crazy, we can wear that label as a badge of honor. We can appropriate the usage of crazy from the beatnik era when crazy meant something wonderful or excellent or perfect. And when someone asks us if we are still Christians, still disciples of Jesus, and still crazy after all these years, we can respond joyfully and faithfully. Crazy, man. Crazy. Amen. Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks this day for the blessings and gifts of life. We thank you for being the foundation that supports our roots, for anchoring us richly, for nourishing us through the rocky days, the stormy nights, the wind, rain, and cold. During times when it seems all but impossible to stay grounded, you hold on to us. We thank you for being there even when we are certain that we are all alone, abandoned to harsh elements. Compassionate one, we ask that you comfort this day those who need you most, those who are struggling with their last breath, those who are taking their first breath, those who need release and the chance to take a deep cleansing breath, bring them your peace. God of grace, lead us into your truth, your ways. Help us each and every one in all walks of life, to hold before us a vision of your love. 
Help us all to love as you love, generously and mercifully. Give us your eyes and your heart. Help us to be your hands and help us to mend the broken places. Merciful God, forgive us when we fail, pick us up when we fall, sustain us when we doubt, guide us when we fear, embrace us when we cry, and laugh with us when we have joy. Then help us to do the same with those we meet, those we know, those we encounter day and night, even those whose lives we do not know. Help us to see deeply into the pain we cause, knowingly or not. Help us to exhale your mercy that others may inhale your love. In all these ways, help us to know you as a God of relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mother of all creation, friend, comforter, sustainer. For we pray now in the words of your Son, Jesus, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, let us believe in God's grace and love and give with generosity that God's goodness may be known to the world in our time.
may we be in a spirit of prayer. Generous God, take our gifts this day and use them so we may be part of your great work in this world. Through our giving, bring justice and love closer to all, not just in our community, but in the world beyond these walls. Strengthen our church and Christians everywhere into a powerful voice for healing and peace. Amen. Let us conclude our worship with singing. Let us go now, praising God's name with our whole hearts. May we rejoice in the work of the Holy Spirit, even when others call it evil and denounce it as mad. And may God extend grace to us and through us. May Christ Jesus walk with us in the midst of trouble. And may the Holy Spirit prepare us for glory beyond all measure.
Let us go now in peace and serve our God. Amen. Thank you.